Retail therapy is one thing, but being a shopaholic is an entirely different thing. And while pop culture views that particular ailment through a rose-tinted lens, Ooh, I wonder if they have that my size. It's an actual compulsive disorder, rooted in the same part of the brain as substance abuse and gambling addiction. Researchers link the pleasure most people experience from shopping to dopamine. When you set out to buy something new, your brain anticipates a reward from that shiny purchase, so it starts firing dopamine in the so-called reward center of your brain, which makes you feel great. The primitive biological point of this was to encourage human ancestors to explore. Mother Nature's way of rewarding the brave soul who saw a pineapple and said, I bet I could eat that. Of course, chasing that good feeling has its limits. Most people don't have unlimited physical or financial resources to buy, eat, or drink everything they want. This is where self-control comes into play for an average person. And self-control is a relatively new instinct, which may explain why so many people struggle with resisting a delicious dessert. Desire comes from the more primitive reptilian part of our brains. Self-control is prefrontal cortex. It's more the newer part of our brain where we engage in control. So the desire will come up for everybody from that more emotional part of the brain, the rational part, the logic center, our self-control tries to control that. When humans desire something, specifically when shopping, the brain ends up using a lot of energy to curb that desire, essentially depleting self-control. And once self-control is depleted, that's when most people tend to exhibit impulsive behaviors, like grabbing 15 sample size products from Sephora's checkout line, despite only going in there for a mascara. Dr. Faber identifies two types of shoppers, compulsive versus impulsive buyers. Most people fall into the latter camp. Some people more than others are more prone to it, but you know we all do it sometimes. And even the people who are the most extreme at impulse buying sometimes control that buying. We all have desires and impulses to, to do things. Many of them, in fact, most of them, I'd say we control. That self-control, we view it as a resource. It's kind of like a muscle. You can work and build up muscles and you can get stronger. If you're lifting weights, there's a limit on, you know, even a light weight. You can only do so many times and, you know, lactic acid builds up and, you know, your muscle gets fatigued. Self-control is the same kind of thing. That we can engage in self-control, but within a brief period of time, we can fatigue our ability at self-control and we lose our ability. While most people can more or less exercise self-control when it comes to impulse shopping, an estimated 5.8% of the U.S. population actually cannot. They're known as compulsive shoppers. Unlike impulsive buyers, for compulsive shoppers, buying is not about the desire for an item. It's about creating an escape. Compulsive buyers tend to be perfectionistic. They set very high standards for themselves. Like anybody who sets very high standards, you're occasionally going to fail. For compulsive buyers, they internalize those failures. They don't think of it as, oh, you know, I just didn't do really well, I should have studied harder or something. They internalize it as, I'm a bad person. I'm really awful, I'm not worth anything. For some people who have this, they look to escape these feelings because these feelings are almost obsessional. They're always with them. People find different activities that allow them to escape those feelings for a brief period of time. For some, it's drugs and alcohol. For some people, it turns out it's buying. A 2012 study by Huey Lowe and Nigel Harvey observed 150 participants to compare how compulsive shoppers' decision-making differs from the average buyer's. They found that most compulsive shoppers were essentially unfazed by overspending, while a whopping 77% of non-compulsive shoppers were disappointed when going over budget limited their ability to make purchases. They also found that compulsive shoppers were significantly less aware than non-compulsive shoppers of when they exceeded their budgets. That's what happens to people when they shop. They are in the zone, they are blocked. They'll talk about feelings, textures, smells, sounds of the shopping environment. Most compulsive buyers we talk to don't like going shopping with other people because it breaks that. Being completely absorbed by the sensations is what they really seek because it blocks out their thoughts and they don't feel bad about themselves 
for that period. In fact, some of them will even have these grandiose feelings. They feel like they're powerful or successful when they're shopping briefly, but it's not for the things they buy. In fact, one of the interesting things about compulsive buyers is a large number of them never use the things they buy. They end up still in the bag they bought them in. They'll still have the tags hanging on them. That is, of course, a problem. Shopaholics often end up bankrupt and with strained relationships, like anyone suffering from an addiction. Combating compulsive shopping is a huge task that demands a cultural shift in how we view addictive behavior. Society's views of addiction tend to follow a similar pattern. An alcoholic used to be the lovable town drunk or the drunk uncle. A prescription drug addict used to be the esoteric hippie spinster down the block. While a shopaholic is a ditzy girl who maxes out her dad's credit card. I think compulsive buying is still not treated as serious. We can accept drugs and alcohol because they're substances and we ingest them and so they somehow change us. Well, the fact of the matter is all behavior changes our brain chemistry and that's where the addiction occurs. And I think one of the most important things we can do is to realize these things are serious. Solutions are much more attainable for impulsive shoppers. An effective way of controlling impulsive behavior is distance. It's much easier to avoid buying the entire Mac palette if you just beeline for the one eyeliner you came in for. If you can't help but browse, remember to avoid peeking at the counters lining the checkout line, since your self-control is likely to be depleted at the end of the shopping trip. Consider shopping earlier in the day for the same reason. 